Welcome to section 17.2. So in chapter 17, we're talking about solutions and a big component of that is solubility. Now you guys might remember from elementary school that you guys talked about how much things are soluble in each other. They might have given you kind of this old adage that like dissolves like, meaning that if you have polar solvents, in general, what's going to be most soluble in that are polar solutes. And if you have nonpolar solvents, well, nonpolar solutes are going to go into that. And the classic example is oil and water. So let's kind of go a little bit more in depth with this and take a look at our molecules. Now in chapter 16, we talked about intermolecular forces and I wanted you guys to describe what forces are present in a molecule. So let's take a look at vitamin C. And what you guys will notice is that it has a lot of oxygens and hydrogens and carbons. This is considered an organic compound. Now from here on out, what I want you guys to note is the electronegativity of carbon is about the same as hydrogen. So whenever you see a CH bond, well, these things are going to be considered nonpolar bonds, and you will have just LDFs around them. Now, what you guys will also notice in this compound is oxygen. Oxygen is one of the most electronegative atoms on the periodic table, and so wherever you see an oxygen, what you get are little dipoles around there. And so what you will see in this compound is this compound is surrounded by little bar magnets. So this is a polar molecule and vitamin C is soluble in water. So when you guys go to the store, you guys can buy those vitamin C tablets, you crush them up, you dissolve it in water, and then you guys could go ahead and drink it. Let's take a look at vitamin A. Now vitamin A, you guys will see, I have all these CH bonds. And that means that these are all known nonpolar. In fact, the bulk of this molecule is just made out of CH bonds, which means the bulk of this molecule is nonpolar. It does have a little bar magnet at the end, but it is dwarfed by the nonpolar this, of this molecule. And so what you will find is this molecule is not soluble in water because it has a large contingency of nonpolarness to it. And so this is not soluble in water, but what it is, is it is fat soluble. And so the way that you guys get vitamin A is you guys go ahead and consume things like plants and animals. And in the fat stores of those plants and animals are the vitamin A, which you guys go ahead and extract. So when we look at this really simple elementary term, like dissolves like, it does play a big role in things like your vitamin uptake. Another big important thing is the environmental impact of solubility. So let's take a look at the classic case of DDT. Now DDT was this, it was this pesticide used to help our agriculture flourish. And what you will note about DDT is that it is fat soluble. So here's what occurred in the environment that no one kind of predicted. What happened is they spread DDT into the environment across the crops. And since it's a spray, the concentration is very low in DDT. What you can see is it's 0 0.003 parts per billion. So barely anything was there and people thought this was safe. There's no way this amount or the small amount of chemical is going to do any harm. Well, what happened is the bacteria, the microorganisms, they started to consume the DDT. And because it's not water soluble, they could not excrete it. And so what happened is all the DDT started to accumulate in their fat storages. And so if we were to look at the microbes, well, the concentration of DDT in the microbes themselves was increased. It went up to about 0.04 parts per million. Well, the microbes, well, they are around our aquatic life. And so the small fishes came around and started eating the, the, these microbes that were contaminated with DDT. And again, they couldn't excrete it. It was stored in their fats. And so the concentration of DDT went up again. So if we were to look at these fish, 0.5 ppm. Finally, the little fish 
gets eaten by the big fish. And again, the same story happens. We start concentrating that DDT because it's not getting excreted and it's starting to go up in our fat cells being stored there at 2 ppm. And then finally, the majestic eagle comes along, eats the big fish, and what we see is that all that DDT in the fat stores of the fish get now concentrated in the eagle itself. It's not excreting it. And we get dangerous levels of DDT in our wildlife. And so this process is called biomagnification. The idea that even if you put something that is not very concentrated in the environment, there's chances because of solubility that it will start to concentrate uh, because they're getting stored in certain places and not being spread out. Now, before we get into the thermodynamics of solution, we should talk about one process, and that is dissolving of ionic compounds. So we touched upon this in Chem 1A. So if I look at NaCl, what you guys will know, it, it will dissolve into water and form Na plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. So I want you guys to remember what Aq means. AQ means it is surrounded by water molecules. What happens is if I have my Na+, my water molecule is going to orientate itself such that the negative oxygen is pointing towards that positive hydrogen. And then if I have Cl-, what I'm going to have is the opposite. I'm going to have my positive hydrogens pointing towards that chlorine. And so this interaction is the ion dipole interaction. It's why, uh, it's why ions dissolve into liquid water. And that's because we have these new intermolecular force, this new intermolecular interaction between ion and dipoles. And again, just remember, these are just bar magnets and charges being attracted to each other. So let's talk about the dissolution process. If I want to say something is soluble in some media, what I'm really asking, is this going to spontaneously happen? If I'm asking about spontaneity, I have to look at delta G, the Gibbs free energy. Now you guys will recall from Chem 1B, Gibbs free energy is based off of delta H and delta s and so what we can look at is we can look at these processes we can look at the enthalpy of dissolution or when i dissolve that something and the entropy of dissolving that substance so both of these are going to factor if my thing is going to dissolve or not now both delta h and delta s can be positive or negative and so we have to think about what conditions will make them positive and negative, and then ultimately lead us to a spontaneous reaction where we have a negative delta G. So take a look at this picture. This picture is in your book, and it describes the dissolution process. So look at what's happening and tell me which of these steps do you think is endothermic? All right, general people, what I hope you determined was that steps one and two are the ones that are endothermic. So let's go ahead and talk about the dissolution process. So the idea here is I wanna mix my solute with my solvent. Now to get this process started, what I need to do is I need to first spread my molecules apart. And so what you guys will see is that I'm taking these molecules and not having them touch each other. So if I look at that, what I wanna do is I wanna overcome their stickiness, or in other words, I wanna overcome their intermolecular forces. So to do that, to overcome their intermolecular forces, I have to put energy into the system. That's why delta H1 and delta H2 are gonna be positive. So let's go ahead and take a look at an energy diagram Delta H1, delta H2, these are breaking intermolecular forces. This is me spreading my molecule apart. So that means energy into my system. Now what we can take a look at is when I start mixing things together. Now, once I've scrambled these particles up, 
Well, they will see each other anew and they'll start making new intermolecular forces. They'll start attracting each other. And so if I make intermolecular forces, if I put things together, well, this is the opposite of me breaking things apart. This is me getting energy out because when I put two things together, this is a lower energy system. So energy is going to be released. So delta H3 is always going to be a negative. And so this is going to be me forming IMFs, where this was me breaking my IMFs or intermolecular forces. Now, what you guys will notice is I started off with my two separate entities. And after my whole process is done, I get my mixture or my solution. And so this difference right here is my delta H of solution. Now, the first example that I've given you is an exothermic example. And that's because what you will see is that my delta H1 and my delta H2, well, that was smaller than my delta H3. Now, I could have it such that my delta H1 and 2 are much bigger than my delta H3. That is going to lead to an endothermic delta H of solution, meaning I have to put energy in to put this mixture together. What I have here are three scenarios. Me mixing a polar substance with something that's polar, me mixing something that's nonpolar with something that's nonpolar, and finally something that is nonpolar mixed with something that is polar. Now in all three of these examples, what you will see is my delta S of solution is gonna be greater than zero. And this is me talking about it in broad generalities. So if you take a look at this, we have nice ordered things with our solute and our solvent. And then at the end, we have this mixture where it's all chaotic, all jumbled up. So what you can say is that we're going to a more chaotic state or a more disordered state. And if we're going to a more disordered state, that means the entropy has to be positive. But now let's talk about delta H, what we were talking about on that last slide. So let's go ahead and talk about delta H1, delta H2. So remember, delta H1, this is me breaking up solute-solute interactions. And then we have delta H2. And remember, this is me breaking up my solvent-solvent interaction. Now, if I were to break up a polar solute, well, that's relatively a lot of energy because polar bonds usually mean I have dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding. So it's going to be a lot for my delta H1, and it's also going to be a lot for my delta H2. Now, my delta H3, remember where that's coming from. That's me interacting my solute with my solvent. It is those intermolecular forces that I make. If I bring together two different bar magnets, well, there's a lot of energy that's going to occur. Whether that energy is bigger than delta H1 and delta H2, well, it depends on the strength of the bar magnets and how much they like each other. So in this kind of scenario, my delta H solution can either be positive or negative. What's probably going to occur is my delta S solution is going to overcome any disparity that this produces and my polar substance is going to dissolve in my polar substance. Now let's talk about nonpolar, nonpolar. So if I'm going to talk about nonpolar, nonpolar, that means probably these things just have LDF forces. Now again, my delta H1 is going to be endothermic. And this time I'm going to go ahead and draw really teeny arrows. That's because breaking up nonpolar bonds aren't going to take a lot of energy. And what I can do with my delta H3, well, it turns out that no matter what, the delta H3 is not going to be any different than delta H1 plus delta H2. LDFs don't have the variety uh, that polar bonds have. So most likely what's going to happen is you are going to get exactly the energy that you put into the system and you're going to get that right back out. And so what happens here is my delta H of solution is basically zero. 
So for nonpolar, nonpolar, what we can truly say is that this is dictated by the entropy of dissolution, meaning that just because we're scrambling nonpolar things together, that is why they dissolve. So nonpolar, nonpolar, that's going to be a spontaneous process and they are going to dissolve each other. Now let's go ahead and discuss the last scenario, the one we said was not going to be spontaneous. And let's go ahead and see why this isn't spontaneous. So we're going to break up a nonpolar thing. So let's say that's delta H1, and that's going to be small. And then we're going to break up something that's polar, and that's going to be delta H2. Now what I have is my delta H3. And remember what delta H3 is. That's me bringing my solute and my solvent together. And what interactions that a nonpolar species will have with a polar species. And so what you can think about is how does a bar magnet interact with a popsicle stick? They don't have too much interaction. You're not going to get a lot of attraction. And the same thing is going to happen with these molecules. And so what happens is my delta H3, the energy that I get back out, is incredibly small. What we'll see is that my delta H of solution is not only going to be large, but it's going to be greater than zero. And so if my delta H is large and greater than zero, that's going to make my delta G large and greater than zero. And remember, if I have a large positive delta G, that means it's non-spontaneous. So I hope what you guys get out of this slide is the reasoning behind like dissolves like. And the idea here is that we can look at the delta H and delta S of solution and see why this is a spontaneous process for the likes and not a spontaneous process when we have dissimilar things. All right, so let's just finish off this with a real simple quiz. Go ahead and tell me which of these are more soluble in water. Okay, so if we have water, H2O, this is a polar substance. And let's go ahead and take a look at our two objects right here. So the first thing what you'll notice is you don't even have to draw the structure out. You know it's made out of C's and H's. So the only force that this has is LDFs. That's because carbon and hydrogen have the same electronegativity. So any combination of carbon and hydrogen will lead to a nonpolar molecule. And the only force nonpolar has is LDF forces. Now, the other one that you guys see is this molecule right here. And if you guys wanted to draw the Lewis structure, here's what it would look like. We can go ahead and take a look at the central atom right here. And what we'll notice with the central atom is that it is SN4. So what I'm going to lead to is a bent structure. So as I've drawn it here, we have a bent molecule with oxygen being more electronegative. So I'll have dipoles going this way. The dipoles don't cancel out. So this is something that has dipole dipole forces and LDFs. But since it has dipole dipole, this is a polar molecule. And so if that's the case, like dissolves like. I hope that made sense to you guys and stay safe, Chem1C.